which was a diplomatic success, obviously, in getting the countries all to sign up to this statement. But of course, to get from a statement to action is a very different matter. And I think two points are important. One is that uh, even the pledges are not quite enough to achieve the goal of constraining temperature rise. But I think the main point is that although it's high on the political agenda now, it's all too easy for these long-term issues to drop down on the agenda, being trumped by the short-term and the parochial. And that's why I think it's very important to ensure that the public remains interested and concerned about climate change. And it's not just a few experts talking to politicians. What's far more effective is getting through to the media and to the public, because what politicians care about is what the press says and what's in their inbox. And so I think the important thing, if we want to make sure that the pledges turn into actions, is to ensure that the uh, public remains concerned enough to ensure there's continuing press interest and continuing public interest in these. But there are good things that came out of Paris too, because the agreement to reconvene every five years to assess progress is clearly important. And that means it can't completely drop off the agenda now. It's going to be very hard to raise it high in the public consciousness because, as we all know, the consequences are far away in the future. The worst consequences are. And it's going to be very hard to maintain it. Uh, but we can do our best. And I think in this connection, uh, one of the very important events of the last year was the papal encyclical. Because the uh, Pope represents an organization which has long-term concerns and cares about the world's poor and has huge traction, especially in the countries of Latin America, Africa and East Asia. And that, I think, was an important influence in the voting and the perception of the politicians who were in Paris. And I think uh, the views of organizations like the church, that the environment is important, that long-term concerns about future generations are important, is going to be very important effective in ensuring that uh, the public doesn't just focus on short-term concerns. But didn't the rather swift change from a two-degree target to a 1.5-degree target seem to me to uh, fly in the face of the, the reality that two degrees is going to be not impossible to achieve? Uh, let's go for one and a half degrees. It, it seemed to be just ignoring the science and being <laughs> politically expedient. Well, I think that was obviously a sort of sop to the uh, um, enthusiastic campaigners who had said that keeping it at two degrees is not good enough. So I think to put that in as an aspiration was... But doesn't, uh, doesn't, that, doesn't that diminish the, the meaningfulness of the process if, if you can so glibly change your target from two degrees to one and a half degrees? Well, I think it's more fundamental concern about whether the best index of climate change is temperature rise anyway. Well, we can't link, we, we don't know what the linkage is between temperature rise and CO2 in the atmosphere. Well, that's one uncertain, that's the carbon sensitivity, uh, which is uncertain because of the feedback from water vapour and clouds, etc. Well, is this right in here? This is, this is an article which says that 430 parts per million is the level that the UN IPCC says corresponds to 1.5 degrees. I mean, we're going to get to 430 mm. parts per million in the next couple of years. I yes, think. but there's an uncertainty, of course, because the uh, so-called car carbon sensitivity, which is the uh, factor by which the um, effects of feedback and water vapor amplifies yeah. the effect of CO2 itself, that is an uncertain factor. So I think uh, the scientists can't yet say what constraint on CO2 corresponds to two degrees in temperature. But I think more important than that is to realize that um, the, the global temperature rise is uh, probably not the best index of climate change anyway, because um, different parts of the world warm up differently, of course. And what's more important um, to any particular country is changes in its rainfall or things like that. Those are the important things. Um, and we want to have measures of those. And also, uh, we know that because of El Nino, etc., the uh, temperature rise does go in fits and starts. And a much greater uh, 
amount of heat, of course, is going into the oceans and not into the atmosphere. And uh, there's a figure in the IPCC report, which actually should have been highlighted more, which shows the uh, heat content of the oceans, which is, is rising steadily, um, even though the temperature rise in the atmosphere has been uh, going irregularly. So the focus on the heat content of the uh, oceans would be a better measure anyway. The Arctic temperature at the moment is, is very worryingly high. And um, mm -hmm. even if global averages were around normal, the fact that the Arctic is warm is particularly worrying. Well, that's right, because that's the kind of thing that's going to lead to change in weather patterns, the, guess, the um, jet stream, etc. And there are some who are saying that melting Arctic permafrost will lead to uh, methane release. And mm -hmm. well, we're, we're yet to see how significant that will be, but it, mm. it has potential to be particularly yes. worrying. Well, that's one of the so-called tipping points, isn't it? Mm. When uh, the straight extrapolation uh, doesn't continue and there's some steeper rise. And uh, uh, one of the arguments that's used for a two degree limit is that it's thought that that will avoid us going through any of these tipping points. We just don't know. But we don't really think that the Paris Agreement is going to keep the temperature rise below two degrees, do we? I mean, and in which case, these tipping points may well be reached um, in spite of Paris Agreement being signed up by everybody. I think that's true. It may slow down the, uh, the rise and therefore delay these, give us more time for action. But uh, I personally am rather pessimistic about the uh, uh, claimed targets being reached anyway. Um, because I think fossil fuels are going to be dominant for the next uh, 30 or 40 years. Um, and that's why I'm particularly keen about uh, a separate proposal, which is to uh, try and persuade countries to enhance their level of R&D into uh, non-carbon energy generation. Because we know that uh, as the costs of uh, solar have come down, it's become more competitive with other kinds of energy generation. And if we could have R&D at an accelerated rate, that's going to bring closer the day when the costs of alternative energies fall to be competitive with fossil fuels. And therefore, countries in, say, Africa and uh, Asia, which are going to need more energy in future, will then be able to jump directly to uh, carbon-free and won't be tempted to build coal-fired power stations. Well, we in the UK, some of us back last summer, um, proposed a scheme uh, to enhance publicly funded R&D into, uh, uh, in particular, um, solar storage and grids. We didn't put in nuclear because we knew that that would not get support in Germany and in Japan. And the idea was to try and get uh, broad support for an enhanced program of R&D into those energy sources. And uh, at Paris, there was discussion of this. And uh, as I understand it, a slightly different initiative spearheaded by the US and India um, is getting some traction. And they've got the G7 signed up plus about 10 other countries, and also some private sector support. Bill Gates et al. have pledged collectively several billion dollars. Yeah. And this, I think, is important because this will actually increase um, the uh, level of support because even people who are um, skeptical about climate change are in favor of this. And in fact, I had an amusing experience back last June because I was one of the proponents of this so-called Apollo project. And uh, I went on the BBC and they always try to get someone to rubbish you in a discussion, you know. And they got uh, Born Lomberg from Copenhagen, the Copenhagen Consensus, uh, thinking he'd rubbish me. But he agreed 100%, as I knew he would, uh, with the uh, aim of uh, improving the uh, uh, efficiency of all clean energy sources. And so that is an indicator that there'd be far broader support for this project than for uh, the sort of bare bones cutting down on energy emission. If you think though in terms of using solar, let's say, to replace fossil fuels for electricity generation, mm -hmm. well globally only about 20 or 25 percent of our energy consumption is via electricity. Mm. Um, we have to 
really change the infrastructure of our, our household heating, of our transport, of our shipping, mm. of, of industry, yes. uh, to be properly um, decarbonized. And is that going to be easy? I mean, it's, well, it's, not, it's not going easy, to be extremely but, difficult. Uh, and, and obviously, um, uh, uh, if there's a transition towards electric cars, which may happen, um, that's uh, not going to help if the electricity comes from coal-fired power stations. No, it'll really. only uh, work if it comes from uh, some sort of clean energy. Um, and that's why storage is so important. Mm. The viability of solar, obviously, is hugely enhanced if one can economically store energy. And for instance, Elon Musk's company is building this huge factory in the States to build sort of household level batteries. And the one that he's going to be marketing next year will store 15 kilowatt hours, have a maximum power output of five kilowatts. And that's the kind of thing which uh, um, can provide a household supply for at least a day or so, and therefore be combined with solar very efficiently. It's interesting you say 15 kilowatt hours is enough to provide household power for about a day. But is that true? That That's a true. very American figure. Um, Indeed. I, yeah. I, I, I reckon that averaged over the year, my house, with, with five of us living in it, mm. averages about one kilowatt hour per day. Um, mm. which, well, you're an inspiration to us all, and of well, course, no, but that, we should aspire towards that, clearly. But I don't, yeah, think, yeah. I don't think it's mm. that uh, atypical. Um, mm -hmm. But I think if you go to large houses in big, sprawling cities, mm. then um, they have to be kept warm or kept cold. There are a lot of appliances. There might mm. be mm. several refrigerators in the house. Mm. There might mm. be yes. several microwave ovens, and, and they're all running. And, and, of course, you may need air conditioning in some hotter countries than Britain. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I, I think that um, if we're going to reach our targets for decarbonisation, We've got to change to solar and, and, and tidal and whatever it might be, mm. but we've also got to reduce our demand. Well, absolutely, and, and yes. And mm. if the two happen together, mm. then I think we've got a chance. Yes. But if we carry on with consumption as normal, I don't mm. think we can possibly achieve these Paris targets. No, I'm sure that's true, especially if other countries like India are going to e really increase their consumption. And aspire to our... Yes. Mm to our lifestyles. Yes. Yeah. And we've got to uh, converge at something like uh, three or four um, tons per year per person. Uh -huh. uh, but of course, the other key question is whether nuclear is part of this mix or not. And here, there's a, um, a big debate at all levels of sophistication about whether but nuclear it, is a it good ought, thing. It ought think. not to be taken off the table. No, no and I think the, the point is that um, uh, there should be R&D into fourth generation nuclear, because the trouble with nuclear is that the designs now being uh, uh, promulgated uh, and uh, going to be used at Sizewell and um, uh, other places um, are really designs dating back to the 1960s. Mm. There's been hardly any R&D in nuclear and there are lots of ideas. I don't know whether they work. There's a small modular reactor, pebble bed, traveling wave and all these other ideas for fourth generation nuclear. And I think at least there should be some R&D into these to see if any of them uh, can become more acceptable on the grounds of safety and security than the existing designs. It's interesting if so, if we're going to need these, them. these small modular reactors, mm -hmm. there are designs now for 10, 15, 20 megawatt um, reactors, which, well, if you think it through, they would fit on an airplane. Um, <laughs> so there's a world out there that we'll move to nuclear aircraft. Um, yes. Well, this question of... Uh, power to mass ratio, isn't there? But, uh, mm. Well, uh, they're not that heavy. Mm. If you think in a, a, a large aircraft fills up with um, several hundred tons of fuel mm. When, mm. Uh, when it goes on a yeah, long yes, flight, yes, yes. you can have 50, 100 tons worth of reactor if you want, instead mm. of the fuel. Well, um, like submarines, yeah. <laughs> like submarines. Yes, yeah. Um, will, we, will we ever consider solutions like that as being sensible and put them on the table for discussion? Or would, do we just reject them outright because they're stupid? Well, my, my feeling is burning fossil fuels in perpetuity is very stupid. Mm -hmm. So we've got to reject that one outright. Yes. And mm -hmm. what's left on the table ends up being small modular nuclear reactors. Mm. Well, there should opinion. be research, certainly. There and, should uh, be research. Um, and for, um, for ships and uh, uh, 
uh, and maybe surface transport in trucks, they could be used. So I agree that if we're going to dispense entirely with fossil fuels, we're going to need nuclear, um, or we're going to need CCS to, uh, so, um, to counteract the fossil fuels. So carbon, carbon sequestration and storage, mm. or I guess more um, completely Bex bioenergy bio with carbon sequestration and storage, mm -hmm. is built into the Paris agreements. Yes, and I think that's a weakness because, uh, as we know, the uh, R&D and the demonstration plants are being delayed. Been delayed, well, uh, closed down. And, and the, the UK one has been closed down. And even if it works, um, it's very hard to imagine this can be scaled up. So well, it's The to, scale uh, is extraordinary because yes. right now, as we speak, we are globally generating, say, 40 billion tons of CO2 per year. And mm -hmm. let's suppose we want to suck up and store, say, half of that. We've got to develop an industry of carbon sequestration and storage of 20 billion tons of mm -hmm. CO2 mm -hmm. per year. We don't handle 20 billion tons of anything. Mm -hmm. Iron ore, we handle perhaps the order of, of a billion tons of iron ore, or mm -hmm. oil, coal, and gas is a, is a few billion tons. Mm -hmm. How are we going to develop a new industry mm -hmm in a matter of a very few years, decades, mm. to handle 20 billion tons of CO2. Mm. It, it beggars belief. No, I, I agree. And of course, uh, the, the uh, demonstration plants have been designed to go near a place where there is storage, like uh, under the North Sea. But yeah. there are going to be all kinds of problems. And uh, certainly in, in countries that like litigation, like the United States, mm. there's going to be a whole lot of problems about uh, uh, having CO2 stored under your house and all that. So I can see big problems. And for that reason, um, I think it's going to be very unlikely that very large-scale CO2 storage is going to be part of the mix. And that's why I think we really do have to push hard towards um, uh, maximum solar energy, um, which I think is the most promising of the renewables, um, and probably some nuclear. Because, of course, you mentioned um, tidal and waves and all that. Um, it's surprising how little one can get from, uh, from those. And well, uh, uh, David Mackay, in his book, you, you, made estimates for the UK, which is a good place because we have big tidal ranges. But even here, it's not very efficient. It's, it's not very efficient. Tidal isn't very efficient. Mm. But there are some places, like, for instance, North Wales, where flood defences are important because mm. they get tidal surges coming through the Irish Sea. Mm. You can imagine a combination of tidal power and flood defences. And thinking about tidal lagoons, mm. it does give you the potential for pump storage system. So mm. you can imagine, you were talking, Martin, about the importance of energy storage. Mm. Mm -hmm. If you have a place where you need flood defences, and you've got a good tidal range, so you can generate tidal power. How about setting it up as a means of, of storing energy at the same time? Mm. Now, well, this all begins to make sense, mm. but tidal power on its own doesn't make sense, I don't think. No, um, and uh, I think there is a problem because there's this proposal for the uh, uh, tidal lagoon in Swansea, mm. which looks a lovely idea, um, but it is claimed it'll only produce a mean power of two or three hundred uh, well, megawatts, which isn't very efficient. It isn't very power, good. Yes. The, the Swansea scheme, I think, is it's quite a good demonstrator, I guess. Mm. But it, it's the wrong place for it. It's, mm. it's hemmed in by the size of Swansea Bay. Mm -hmm. um, the tidal range is, is big, but it's not huge. And well, what about we, the Seven it. Barrage? The Seven Barrage, environmentally, I, I think what, what happened in the Seven was, and you ended up pitching environmentalists against environmentalists, mm. because the environmentalists mm. saying we need green energy yes. were up against the, the environmentalists saying we need to protect our wading birds. That's um, right, and the Seven Boar. And the Seven Boar. I mean, it, it's, mm. it, it was mm. always going to be a difficult place. Yes, yes. My feeling is that if you're going to try out tidal energy, do it in a place which is already ravaged by repeated um, flooding mm -hmm. and set the tidal power scheme up mm -hmm. as a means of controlling flooding. Yes. Mm -hmm. If we start to think in that way, mm -hmm. um, then renewable energies may be um, 
quite a sensible option. Yes, uh, and of course the economics may not be that bad because I remember uh, being told that the Seven Barrage will produce as much power as two and a half nuclear power stations, uh, seven gigawatts or something yes, like that, well, um, and uh, um, at a cost of 30 or 40 billion, that seemed a lot, but compared to what they're now talking about as the cost of nuclear power stations, that doesn't look so bad. And moreover, um, a lot of the engineering work to make a barrage would be there for 100 or 200 yeah. years, um, and therefore that would seem to make it a slightly less uh, an economic investment. project. Yeah. Mm. The title, of course, does have a, um, an intermittency. It's very predictable, mm. but every, every two weeks you get big tidal range, mm. uh, and in between you get small tidal mm. range. Mm -hmm. And then in the spring and the autumn you get very big Little, yes. tidal range. You, you have to develop storage systems as well if you're, if you're thinking about tidal. Yes, to um, store it for more than just a day. To store it for more than just a day. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think a multiplicity of energy solutions is what we need. Mm -hmm. um, solar where it's sunny, wind where it's windy, uh, tidal where there's mm -hmm. big tidal range. And also we have to be willing to change our habits, perhaps to use the energy when it's available. Um, I remember uh, visiting Mechincliffe in, uh, in Wales. There was a photocopying machine, and above the photocopying machine, it said, uh, please only use this, ma this machine on windy days. <laughs> well, perfect. Mm -hmm. That's, we ought to mm -hmm. be thinking that way. Um, mm -hmm. The way we used to work, um, we had eggs when the chickens laid eggs. We didn't have eggs if the chickens didn't lay eggs. Mm -hmm. it, it, we expected to make use of resources that were available when they mm. were available. Yes. But it's going to be hard to get people to go back to that style of living. Because I remember uh, talking to um, uh, Martin Ryle, the great radio astronomer, who in his later years became uh, uh, enthusiastically anti-nuclear and pro-wind power. And I remember telling him, uh, well, there's a bit of a problem, isn't there, if we have a calm, cold spell in the middle of winter? His response was, well, we put on warm clothes and close down the country. And that was his idea, but I don't think that's going <coughs> to wash now. Well, it's not going to wash, um, but it might have to. We, we, might, we might genuinely have to change our habits. And I suspect there are some habits which would be easier to change than others, and we ought to start with those ones. Let's mm. do the easy ones first. Yes, but there's another high-tech... Uh, um, project would help, and that is a very large scale DC grid, which should certainly be pan European, um, to bring um, uh, um, solar energy from the sunny parts of southern Europe and even North Africa um, to northern Europe, and also go east west to uh, uh, smooth over the peak demand mm. in different time zones, which is about 7 p.m. in the evening in most countries. And so if we really had a DC grid that was very extensive, it's a huge engineering project, but certainly not as big as building the railways in the 19th century across Europe. Well, so the, and that's the kind of thing that would make the uh, solar energy project more viable. The practicalities of a DC grid, DC can't be easily transformed from one voltage to another. Mm. You then have um, energy losses. Well, I think it's worth okay, doing if one is going to transmit over a very long distance. And maybe that's the case that the, the sun is shining in North Africa and mm. the power is needed in Northern mm -hmm. Europe. Mm -hmm. um, well, that is quite a long distance. Mm -hmm. But this is just the kind of thing that, um, that David Mackay in his wonderful book talks about uh, in, in terms of let's not look particularly at the cost of doing things to wean ourselves off carbon. Let's look at the numbers, let's look at the practicalities. Because it's only if it's practical that cost then is worth talking about. Mm. If it mm. turns out you simply can't do it, mm. if you need to cover the whole of the UK with wind turbines mm. to make a difference, then yeah, yes. well, we may as well not mm. start down that but, road. But solar in the desert is not bad S in that Solar context. in the desert is excellent. Mm.